As we enter the new millennium, we look back on the last 50 years with wonder at the speed of the electronics revolution and with awe at the exponential leap in modern technology. With the digital age now unfolding before our very eyes, the world is becoming even smaller, a truly global community. In nearly all that we see, touch, or hear, the powerful microchip enables it, controls it, or processes it. Microchips are so much a part of normal, everyday life, and yet the origins of these devices remain a mystery to most of us. What are they made of? Where do they come from? It all begins here, on the flat, clean surface of a silicon wafer, the fundamental building block for integrated circuits. And now, the making of silicon wafers. The first step in wafer manufacturing is the conversion of raw polysilicon to single crystal silicon. This is accomplished using the Tchaikovsky crystal pulling process. We will use two types of polysilicon, often referred to as poly. Chunk polysilicon and granular polysilicon. Chunk poly is received in pre-measured and pre-packaged bags and is staged at the crystal puller. It is then carefully stacked by hand in a quartz crucible. Charge stacking is a critical procedure because it maximizes the amount of poly material in the crucible and it contributes to a higher success rate for the production run. For large charge and recharge applications, granular polysilicon can be used to achieve a higher density packing. The granular poly is fed through a quartz tube into the molten chunk poly after the puller is fired. Both types of poly are often combined to produce a more efficient charge. The quartz crucible itself rests inside the puller growth chamber on a pedestal, which is surrounded by a large graphite heater. The heater will provide sufficient thermal energy to melt the entire charge of polysilicon. A precise amount of dopant is then added to the charge. The dopant gives the crystal its electrical characteristics, typically boron for p-type silicon or phosphorus for n-type silicon. After doping, a pencil-sized seed crystal of the desired orientation is inserted into the seed chuck, which is suspended from the upper chamber. It is from this seed that the specified crystal is grown. Finally, with charge stacking complete, the puller chamber is sealed, then purged with argon gas to remove air. Power is applied to the graphite heater that surrounds the quartz crucible. The heater gradually increases the temperature of the polycrystalline silicon until the entire poly has melted. This takes approximately three to four hours. The temperature of the melt surface is carefully controlled to just above the melting point of silicon, 1,420 degrees Celsius. Next, the seed crystal, rotating clockwise, is lowered until contact is made with the molten surface of the counterclockwise rotating crucible. The end of the seed itself melts and under well-controlled temperature conditions remains in contact with the melt surface. The actual pulling process begins with the seed being slowly raised. It is important to note precise temperature control and mechanical stability of the entire system are extremely critical at this stage. The thermal shock of dipping the seed crystal into molten silicon will create dislocations in the seed. In order to eliminate such dislocations and ensure a dislocation-free crystal is pulled, a long, thin neck is grown. The diameter of this neck can be as small as three millimeters with varying lengths. Remarkably, the entire weight of the final crystal, possibly greater than 200 kilograms, will hang from the thin, seemingly fragile neck. Once the neck process is completed, the melt temperature is gradually lowered and the crystal begins to grow to a larger diameter. We refer to this action as controlled freezing. At or near target diameter, the crystal turns downward into the shoulder growth stage. 
During shoulder growth, the facets having fourfold symmetry can clearly be seen. This visual confirmation indicates the crystal has one OO orientation and is of single crystal structure, free of threading dislocations. At the specified diameter, the puller's computer control systems ensure that a constant diameter is maintained throughout the remainder of the body growth. Typically, this could take up to 72 hours, depending on specifications. Internal characteristics, such as resistivity, oxygen, carbon, and micro defects, are fixed during crystal growth. Now the crystal growing process is nearly complete. To ensure structural integrity of the crystal, the diameter is progressively reduced in a controlled manner to form an end cone. Contact with the residual melt is then broken. The crystal is allowed to cool for a brief period until cool enough for handling. The upper chamber is then swung away from the lower chamber and the crystal is removed. Today's CZ type crystal pullers stand as high as 10 meters and produce crystals weighing in excess of 200 kilograms. The diameter of these crystals can range from 100 to 300 millimeters. The crystal is then transported to a modification lab where the seed and taper sections are removed using an ID cropping saw. With both of these unwanted sections removed, the usable section of crystal is now referred to as an ingot. Based on customer specifications, the ingot is cut into shorter sections to optimize the slicing operation that will follow later. At the cutting position of each ingot section, a two millimeter slice of silicon, called a slug, may be obtained for quality control testing of the grown crystal. This includes measurement of resistivity, oxygen, carbon, and bulk defects. Next, the ingot sections are moved to a mechanical lathe area where they are first ground to a uniform diameter. A flat or notch is also added. The end result is a precisely machined section of silicon meeting all the electrical and bulk requirements specified by the customer. Before the ingot proceeds to the wire saws for slicing, it is important to determine the precise crystal orientation of the ingot using X-ray equipment. When orientation is confirmed, ground ingot sections are mounted with an adhesive on an epoxy resin beam. The adhesive is cured before the sections continue on to the wire saws. Wire saw technology allows for the entire ingot to be sliced simultaneously. The basic principle of wire sawing is to feed the ingot section into a web of ultra-thin, fast-moving wire. The cutting action of the wire is created by pouring an abrasive slurry over the wire web. The wire web is, in effect, a single wire being fed from one large wire spool to another. A wire spool may hold up to hundreds of kilometers and is used for a limited number of cuts, then discarded. To achieve the necessary mechanical stability, each saw has a total weight of approximately 10 tons. Microprocessor-based control and precise wire tensioning systems allow for minimal attention to the process during the typically eight hours of slicing. At the end of the cycle, the as-cut ingot section is removed from the saw and the wafers are taken off the epoxy resin beam and cleaned in a series of baths. Now the wafers are measured for thickness, total thickness variation, and warp. After the sawing process, the individual slices have sharp, fragile edges. These edges must be rounded or profiled in order to provide strength to the wafer. This will ultimately prevent chipping or breakage in subsequent processing. For precise wafer tracking purposes, the individual slices can be laser marked on the front or back side surface. Characters can be either barcode or alphanumeric, depending on the specification. Each character of the string must be precisely positioned and remain identifiable throughout the entire device fabrication process. The information contained in the laser mark gives full traceability down to the position of each slice in the ingot. It includes the date, manufacturing plant, and the individual crystal puller. 
It also identifies material characteristics, such as resistivity and orientation. In each of the following steps, we will focus on removing surface damage, starting with the lapping process. In lapping, slices are mounted into carrier templates. The machine is closed, and the slices are then rotated through three different axes relative to the movement of the upper and lower plates. While the plates are rotating, an abrasive slurry is dispensed onto the carriers through tubes in the upper plate. This ensures a more uniform, simultaneous removal of the saw damage present on both front and backside surfaces. The slices are rinsed with a deionized water spray to remove the worst of the lapping slurry and silicon waste. It is also imperative to maintain excellent thickness uniformity at each step of the production process. Why? To produce the very flattest wafers needed for the latest generation of semiconductor devices. After lapping, the slices are cleaned more thoroughly using a conventional wet bench, which has been optimized to remove both particles and metallic contamination. From the wet bench, wafers proceed to the next phase of manufacturing, etching. Chemical etching is necessary for the removal of any residual surface damage left by lapping. Another set of baths combine chemical solutions and precise control of fluid dynamics to produce demanding flatness parametrics. Acid etching also makes the wafer edge stronger, and it produces a high-quality backside for those customers not requiring any additional backside treatments. Wafers are sampled for mechanical parameters and for process feedback. This is followed by a visual inspection for any residual edge, front or backside defects left by the sawing or lapping process. From etching, the slices go to an annealing furnace. Annealing is necessary because oxygen is incorporated from the quartz crucible during crystal pulling. In order to have stable resistivity, as specified by the customer, oxygen donors incorporated in the silicon crystal lattice must be annealed and moved to interstitial sites. Annealing prevents their contribution to the intentional doping by donor acceptor atoms. For those orders requiring backside treatments, one option is to apply controlled sandblasting. In this step, a silica grit carried in a high-pressure water jet is sprayed onto the wafer. By intentionally damaging the backside of the wafer and thereby introducing a localized crystallographic defect called a stacking fault, any metal contamination present in the wafer bulk will be preferentially bound to these stacking faults. This leaves a cleaner front surface to fabricate devices. An alternative solution for extrinsic guttering would be to deposit a thin layer of polysilicon on the wafer backside using a conventional furnace and silane gas. And now we come to one of the last and most critical stages of the wafer manufacturing process. Polishing. Polishing is a chemical mechanical process that produces a mirror-like surface for device manufacturing. Here, the wafers will have their front surface polished to the most stringent of mechanical specifications. Again, flatness is critical due to the limited depth of focus of the device manufacturer's optical equipment used for patterning wafers. On the polishing production floor, a cassette of wafers is placed on the automated polisher. A thin layer of water-based wax is dispensed on a heated, super-flat ceramic block. A robot arm retrieves a wafer from the send cassette. It is then mounted on the block. Each wafer is polished in a multi-step process using different grades of polishing pads and slurry. The end product is a mirror-finished, ultra-flat wafer free of any surface imperfections that could result in device failure during customer processing. However, the polishing slurry, wax, and fine silicon waste must still be removed in a post-polish cleaning process. This is the pre-clean bench, the first in a series of two cleaning systems. The pre-clean process consists of sequential immersion tanks designed to remove residual contaminants. It is a product specification. In addition, 
a certificate of quality conform particles causing device failures. For this reason, system, particle bigger than 0.1 micron in a cubic foot of air. All chemical mixing, filtration, and temperatures are controlled by a computer system monitoring every parameter of the cleaner on a continuous basis. The last stage inside the final cleaner is the isopropyl alcohol, or IPA, dryer. The now very clean wafers are extracted from hot IPA and dried in the IPA vapor. The wafers emerge from the IPA as the flattest and cleanest wafers in the world. But one last test is required before they are ready for packaging. It is one of the most scrutinizing processes in all of manufacturing. Electronic inspection. For certification requirements, wafers are 100% inspected using the latest particle detection tools. These tools use a scanning laser beam that sweeps the wafer's surface. Any particles present on the wafer surface will scatter the incident laser beam. By measuring the reflected light, it is possible to count the number of particles and determine their size, even as small as 0 0.09 microns. For some polished prime wafers, the production process ends here. They will continue on to packaging and then on to the finished product shipping area. However, for some advanced device applications, their journey continues to epitaxy. Epitaxy is a process that grows a thin layer of ultra-pure silicon on the polished slice surface. Trichlorosilane gas is injected into a high-temperature, single-slice epi reactor. As the wafer spins, the gas flows over the top of the wafer. The silicon atoms adhere to the crystalline wafer structure. Here, the wafer cassette is placed in the load chamber of the reactor. The customer specification, or recipe program, is then activated for the run. Behind the exterior chamber door, robotics will deliver to and retrieve each wafer from the reactor's furnace chamber. These epi wafers provide our customers with a technically superior wafer on which to build sophisticated devices. Finally, the epi, or prime polished wafers, are ready for packaging. To guarantee that the integrity of the wafers is not compromised during shipment to the customer, great care is taken to ensure that their high quality is maintained. Wafers are placed in polypropylene or polycarbonate boxes, depending on customer preference. To protect the wafers inside, the box is inserted into a polyethylene bag and is hermetically sealed under low pressure. This bag, in turn, is protected by another bag, an aluminized polyethylene moisture-resistant bag, also hermetically sealed. These meticulously packaged cassettes are now ready to leave our world-class cleanroom. When the production order quantity is complete, the packages are placed into shipping containers and the order is ready to be shipped to our customers, bound for destinations throughout the world. These reusable containers help to protect our environment by reducing packaging waste, and it guarantees the wafers will reach the customer in perfect condition, meeting all the quality standards that they expect and rely on.